Welcome, everyone. We're really happy today to be welcoming Sally Thorne to our Research Talk Conversation series. Today, we'll be talking about a course that Dr. Thorne will be teaching for us at our Qualitative Research Summer Intensive on Monday and Tuesday, July 22nd and 23rd. The course is titled Qual Qualitative Research for Applied Practice. So joining me, Ray Maietta, who um, I am president of Research Talk, is Paul Mihas. Paul, let me let you introduce yourself, um, professional, your professional background. Thanks, Ray. Uh, I am the um, Assistant uh, Director of Qualitative Research and Mixed Methods Research at the Odom Institute for Research and Social Science at UNC Chapel Hill. And I have also been with Research Talk as a consultant since 2001. Great. And uh, with us in spirit today is Jeff Petrozelli, Research Talks Qualitative Research um, Specialist. He is the reason why a lot of almost everything that happens at Research Talk happens. Um, I have been in conversation with him about the course and some of the things that I talked to Sally about will reflect Jeff's thinking about the course as well. So we're going to start out and um, ask you first, Sally, if you don't mind telling us a little bit about yourself. And in particular, as you're doing that conversation, talk to us a little bit about your evolution as a qualitative researcher. Oh, sure. Thanks so much, Ray and Paul, for having me and Jeff in spirit. Um, I'm a nurse, a proud nurse. I'm a professor emeritus in the School of Nursing at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, uh, which is where I'm speaking to you from today. That's uh, the, the, Vancouver is located on the ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam, and we are continually um, reflecting on what that means uh, to have a relationship with the land that's been stewarded so, so thoughtfully for, well, since time immemorial. And um, I, I have had a longstanding relationship with the research talk and the, the crew here. I've had the privilege of being able to go to uh, to Chapel Hill and the wonderful uh, venue that we used to enjoy um, and to be with people and also to continue the relationship virtually. And I think in this new world, um, we're all capitalizing on the, the advantages of being able to connect across the time and space through the ether um, and hopefully continue to make those same relationships. In terms of research, um, as a nurse, I first learned qualitative methods in the 1980s, um, early 1980s. And in those days, um, there was such a, a, a intensity of sort of the need to maintain methodological rigor according to a particular prescribed and specific qualitative method. And that was particularly the case for those of us in the in the health disciplines and nursing. Nursing gravitated toward qualitative research right away because it spoke to all the complex, messy, human nuance stuff that we were really interested in. And up until that point, um, we'd, we'd been really struggling to try and figure out how to frame the things we were interested in into a quantitative question. And so it, it just suddenly opened up this possibility, but it also added a layer of having to do it in the tradition that had been developed in the social sciences, which are different ways of thinking. They're different worldviews than um, are the applied disciplines like mine. And so uh, we didn't, we weren't necessarily becoming many social scientists, although my PhD was in nursing and anthropology, interdisciplinary. Um, but I, I realized I wasn't going to be that, but I wanted to be what I was and find a way to, to move that methodological tradition, all the great things that are invented in methodological design into answering the problems of my discipline. So it got me very excited at an early career stage in rule breaking and sort of trying to, to design studies that were a little bit different than the textbook would have told you you were supposed to, and then justifying it. And I started to realize that that um, I and people like me really needed written reference points. They needed stuff that was written about methodology in that style in order to be able to justify their work. So I got into a pattern of things that eventually uh, took the name of interpretive description, but essentially it's, it's a way of approaching qualitative research to answer the questions of the applied disciplines. 
the health disciplines, education, geography. And, and in fact, the, the, th the disciplines that identify themselves as applied in that way um, have expanded over the years. And the people who turn up in workshops I give are not just nurses and educators and social workers anymore. Um, it's geographers, it's economists, it's anesthetists. I mean, it's, it's, it's people who you would not imagine to be interested in qualitative inquiry, and you wouldn't necessarily understand that they would see that as applied work. So it's become a fun conversation um, over more than 25 years now, and I'm still just as excited about it as I always was. I love so much about what you just said, in particular, the enthusiasm with which you delivered one phrase at the beginning. Um, it really spoke to the messy human nuance stuff. And it's the beauty of what we do, right? We get to kind of drive into that space. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, I think I think that the world has evolved a lot. I mean, so the, the, the things that I took as assumptions that I was operating on under 25 years ago were not the same as they are now. Um, but I am just so encouraged that in healthcare and in many other spheres, that interest in trying to figure out how, how to study things from a human perspective and a complex nuanced perspective um, is there. And even for those whose primary programs of research is quantitative, are starting to really want to figure out how to integrate some of that into their inquiry. And so um, they too aren't going to go, you know, leave their professions and go back into getting a sociology degree or, you know, uh, learning how to do something by first principles. But they do need to have, they want to have, and are craving access to approaches that kind of make sense to them. And one of the things that that I've become quite um, excited about over the years is really realizing that our applied disciplinary epistemological guidance is as powerful or even more so than, a, than what a theoretical framework was in the early days. In the social science world, you've got to have something to hook your study onto. And so the requirement to select a theoretical framework was part of the, that ritualized methodology. But if you're a nurse or you're an oncologist or you're a social worker, your discipline gives you a very, very profound set of, of values and intellectual structures within which you can define a qualitative study. And in doing that, what you're doing is actually using research to enact the, the following along an intellectual curiosity, doing, doing that intellectual detective work of the discipline to follow along and, and, uh, and provide the kind of knowledge that's actually going to speak to your discipline or those that could benefit from that knowledge in the applied world. So it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating journey to make friends with what's all out there. And we nurses have, have a you know ancient history of shamelessly borrowing any new device or technology that any discipline to invents. If it's going to help a patient, we'll take it. So I think similarly in qualitative research, um, this approach has allowed us to be open to all the wonderful new things, including some of the things that are being, being talked about in the courses that you folks deliver, but all the new ways of thinking about arts-based methodologies and, and applied methodologies and building knowledge translation from the outset. So it's it's been a path that's really allowed me to have um, an awful lot of fun engaging with so many creative and interesting people who have such fascinating problems that they want to solve and things that they're curious about and things that they want to inform other people about. Um, gifts that they want to give back to their discipline so people can do what they do better and more fully and um, the kind of people you get to know when you get into these conversations and the things that they're trying to do with their work is incredibly inspiring yeah definitely there's a a special urgency that doesn't require necessarily to do things as quickly as possible but at a proper pace but knowing that it's within an applied context it makes it all real life you know, the, the context of that it, it just increases the value of the work in such a powerful way well, it does and i think one of the keys is that and the thing we call knowledge translation or knowledge integration is built in from the outset like you choose to study a thing because you see where the need for that that knowledge is and you're not you don't choose to study it 
to tell people what they already know. You know, it's not it's not going with a blank state and saying here here's how cancer patients feel anxious when they first get their diagnosis. Well, that's not big news. So, but you're going into the question to say what is there qualitatively in this world that can enhance and enrich and make more fulsome and more beautiful the knowledge that people already have. What can you do to actually excite them into that next level of 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 practice ingenuity? So it's really integrating knowledge translation throughout the whole process, and I find that incredibly exciting yeah absolutely so paul we're um i feel like sally you're bringing us right into the the integration of your story and the course is clear to me and kind of jumping out but i've had the privilege of sitting through your course a couple of times and i just want to check with you paul before we make an explicit turn to the course um anything on your mind as we keep um expanding you know what we're hearing from sally today well, I guess I, I, I am I'm interested in maybe asking about uh, emergent design or designing for emergence um, and how how you kind of think about um, like what 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 do we do with that in in when we're working for, towards um you know um, applied practice and how does emergence fall into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think in one of the, the sort of fundamental issues of, of applied practice disciplines like mine would be that what got written in the textbook published two years ago isn't necessarily quite accurate today. And so you've always got to be using your critical mind to reflect on, you know, what, what else do we know and what's emerging? What's the political context? How have things changed? COVID was certainly an example of that, uh, that ability to just turn on a dime, but not ad hoc. Uh, informed by those core principles that are the disciplinary epistemology. So I think in, in to be satisfying to people in the applied world, it really doesn't make sense to have the kinds of designs that absolutely tightly say, I am going to interview exactly 12 people for exactly 90 minutes each. I am going to do. So the, as, you, as you move into the design, um, it's very typical to be able to say, now that I'm into interview 10, I've suddenly realized I actually probably need a few of these as well. So I'm I'm going further or, you know, whatever the design would be, or I thought I was just going to interview patients who had a certain thing. And several of them were saying, no, you got to have my brother in this interview too, because he's got a perspective on it. And so all of those aspects of emergent design are not unlike what, what our thinking would be doing in our clinical applied practice worlds. Uh, dealing with context and figuring out how to bring in those contextual factors into the study, uh, but not losing track of the, the line of reasoning between the research question, the reason you ask something in the first place, and who it's for, what, what the purpose of it is, so that throughout the whole process, you're paying attention to what the implications might be of any of those design modifications that you make, and you're, you're making them explicit, you're showing how it works and why you did that thing. And I, I, I really kind come to believe over time that that listening audiences and reading audiences of that kind of study really get the logic. It resonates with them. They get why you did what you did. You thought you were going to do this and then you ended up doing that. And the 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 techniques that we use in this thing we call interpretive description, which is not a prescriptive method, but it's a it's a legitimacy to follow that emergent design, if you will, and to be to be upfront and accounting for it to understand how that that influences the design. And I think that is quite different than some of the you know, way back in my history, that idea of methodological fetishism and that the uh, the quality of a study was adhering to exactly the way you thought the world was. I work with lots of colleagues and graduate students right now, and honestly, there's very few studies that, that, that do want to follow through exactly as you set them up. There's very profoundly good reasons to make those modifications, and that's not just slippage. That's, that's thoughtful, intelligent moving into what's going to produce the best findings possible. Yeah, thank you. I love that. Mm -hmm. I was talking recently, Sally, to uh, the spouse of a friend of mine who is now a detective but was on the police force and we were talking a little bit he was curious about what we do and he was talking about what he does and he goes, you know an interesting similarity ray between my work in the field and your work is we never know what's going to happen once we open the door do we mm. and it's it's incredible right and this is the stuff that you and paul are just talking about is we have to know by definition designing before we learn from people doing it every day 
there's only so much that we'll know. And your excitement at, wait, we're at interview 10, and we yeah. could not have known all that stuff, that accrued, accrued knowledge through those 10 interviews that leads us to be transparent and definitively and confidently say, ah, here's a nice enhancement to what we're doing. Absolutely. And so, you know, in, in, in your... In, in your inner intentions and in generating a design, you might have created an interview guide of the kinds of questions you thought you'd ask. But if you're thinking along the way and your analytic brain is moving along the way, you will have wanted to modify those and add a few and maybe take a few away. You, you know, as you as your mind focuses on where is the the kind of knowledge that I'm I really am after. Um, that interview guide should not stay static. So we usually would encourage people to say sample questions for initial interview, just to signal that this is not intended to be a fixed interview and every single person will get asked these questions in this sequence. This is great. This is really giving so far a real flavor for the course, for what people can expect. And I love that you're positioning folks, not just for what to do, and many folks, as the three of us know, come in thinking that what they need and what they want and what they walk away with is, okay, well, Dr. Thorne's going to give me a step-by-step -step that I just follow and magically it works. But, you know, as we segue to think more explicitly about kind of the course, course content, you can let us know how the course is, continues to grow and change. Um, it's not that at all, right? It really is mm -hmm. this how do you become a good, wise decision maker, aligning those decisions with what you knew going in and what you've discovered as it flows? Yeah. So yeah, just, yeah, a little bit more about the course and the life. Of, this has been a, a topic that you worked with for a very long time and uh, it's got a life of its own, doesn't it? Well, it really does. And you know, the course ten, typically attracts people across the spectrum. Um, new graduate students who are just um, approaching their very first study and scholars who've been out there in the field, either using other qualitative methods or perhaps being quantitative researchers um, or who are interested because the graduate students are wanting to go in, in that route and everybody in the, in the middle. So they're, 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 it works with a full range um, of, of experience and different kinds of inquiry so that some will really have a good idea of how, how they want to do studies and are, are looking for some refinements on that and others are just beginning. Some of them will will want the cookbook and I um, unfortunately have to disappoint them because I can't provide a cookbook. I can't have one you know, lockstep sequence that is going to serve all studies. That sort of defeats the the point of it. But many of us have sort of accepted the ideology that you, should, you ought to follow the textbook model for the first study that you do at least. And until it's only in when you're a, an experienced scholar and you've got some qualitative research under your belt that you can legitimately start to, to modify. And I, I, I want to challenge that right away because I think that the young ones and particularly those who are doing research for a purpose. I'm not so confident about those who are simply just wanting to be health researchers and don't have a, a kind of a, a, a disciplinary motivation for why they want to do it. They may need to take different, different approaches. But for those disciplines in which there is a thing to be done in the world, there's a, there's a, a uh, an, an activity, a workout there that's going on that troubles you, that you feel could be better, that you feel we don't understand fully. Um, that is what is guiding your direction going forward. And it should be you that's logically reflecting on what makes sense in this context, what's realistic in this context, what is potentially going to add value to this context. So you can't start with, you know, um, textbook things like saying for a good first study, it'd be nice to have 10 participants in your in your interviews um, this may be a rare disease in which three or four interviews just might give you something incredibly useful or it might be something um, that is sort of hidden within the accounts of people such that you might have to get a large number before you're able to move forward and those are the the, the answers to all of those questions come out of what brought you into the research in the first place so in the course, we, we, we really enjoy the benefit of having questions from all of those directions. And I do think that, that um, wherever, you, wherever you sit and whatever you've already done in research and whatever you feel comfortable with, 
um, these conversations can actually allow you to reflect on what you might be doing differently, how you might legitimize what you're doing, where your options are, and how you can expand. The whole point is really to ensure that if you're taking the time to do a qualitative study, that it has as much potential as possible of being something that speaks to the field in a meaningful way and potentially has implications. Not necessarily radical changes to how we do things, but, but new insights, new ways of thinking about things that can allow you to sort of see it in, in its more fulsome glory, all the intricate nuances of something um, so that people can go in with their clinical imaginations tomorrow. You know, you don't necessarily have to have to do an intervention study to see if this new insight works. But if you say something to a room of clinicians that clicks and they say, yeah, I've seen that. Now that makes sense. I, I'm going to be starting to implement that tomorrow. And that kind of uh, immediate uptake on good ideas that are grounded in human experience, for example, really gets very inspiring. So I, I love that that beginning researchers in their very first study can very often produce things that when you take them to an audience of, of the people that, that it was intended for, they go, yeah, that's great. I get it. It helps me put things together in a different way or it validates the things I suspected but wasn't sure. All of those are possible responses to a well done qualitative study. And and in, in the conversations we have in the class, people get to hear about each other's research. People get to be inspired by different ways of going at problems that, that they hadn't perhaps thought of on their own. And I think it, it, it allows people to conclude after a couple of days of being together with a lot of excitement about the possibilities for their research and a lot more confidence that they can make those thoughtful and intelligent decisions that are going to be consistent with a study that has some value. I love the phrase immediate uptake of good ideas. <laughs> and the part about this that's slippery that I've seen you get people comfortable who weren't comfortable with this through the two-day journey in the course is necessarily when we talk about emergent ideas, new, you know, discovery of new things, is it needs to be not just it, every part of it is a moving target and in a good way. So we can turn folks from the fear of, oh no, what do you mean? I can't predict everything and I can't make it all you know, exactly as it's yeah. going to be. And even the topic itself will be that same moving target, but you have ways to kind of track that, see where that happens, how that happens. Yeah. And I, I've seen you do masterfully, and I don't know if it's explicit or just the nature of who you are and your you know background, your career, who you are as a person, but you bring people to comfort with that to where a point it starts out with a nervousness and trepidation and it closes with this remarkable comfort and excitement over the fact of, oh, okay, I can dance with the fluidity of the nature mm -hmm. of qualitative uh, inquiry. You know, and I think that many, especially, you know, researchers who aren't confident or are newer at it or graduate students who have a supervisory committee who's not totally on board, you know, that that species of, of, of learner um, is particularly anxious sometimes. And um, I think that it's very tempting to try and model what you see sometimes in the qualitative literature as if it's the right thing to do. So to, 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 to take up a claim that you see commonly without really uh, believing in it. And so I try and get people to stay with their authentic truth and to, to not necessarily say that, you know, I will be creating a whole new theory on something um, or not necessarily say the, the way to convey my findings is going to be, I have found X many themes and X many <laughs> subcategories. You know, the, the tabulation of what exists in a database is not finding. So how do you get from what you're able to gather into something that can be useful? And so I use language like what story can be told from the data set that you've got. And I encourage people to ask questions like what can be learned from whatever you intend to do, interviewing people, you know, reading documents, what, whatever you see as the potential data source, what can be learned? And so your job is not to say what all is there. The audience might already know an awful lot of that, but what can be learned and really focus your attention on where are the ideas that might be most relevant and might have the potential to influence practice. So it, it, 
it takes it, it it forces you out of the standard template of how you would articulate and present research into the how do I think about what I've had the privilege of coming to know and uh, explain that in a in an auditable way, in a transparent way that will allow people to come to to the insights that I have. And how do I do that with all of the credibility measures um, that are necessary to qualitative research? You know, qualitative studies go out into a world of readers who are not necessarily qualitatively oriented. And many times we want to influence our colleagues who've been steeped in quantitative methods. But I I I see them responding immediately when they see those kinds of ideas that work. They, 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 they understand how to study things in a certain way. I was just involved the other day in a, in a doctoral defense of somebody who was studying patient satisfaction and all those millions of measures that we've all done of patient satisfaction, but going at it from the critical reflection of the patients in, the, in a particular context allowed even the surgeons who had been using those tools for the whole of their life to say, Oh yes, I see that now. I see different things. So I think that that, that kind of of, uh, of figuring out who who is it that I want to talk to out there, and how can I convey that story? And I don't mean fiction, of course. I mean how can I convey the narrative of what is there in a in an authentic way that will allow people to really get access to that insight. So um, I have a. There's two more main questions I have. I want to check in with Paul, but there's one that um, we get a lot. We being Jeff and I at Research Talk, when folks are kind of looking at the courses, wondering what they want to do. And your course description gives a certain population of uh, folks a pause in a good way. And in particular, they're folks who don't see themselves yet as applied researchers. And, but yet they want an orientation, a qualitative that's realistic, um, that will help them with the kinds of looser skills that are harder to articulate. And they kind of get, as they read your description, this seems like a fit for me, but I'm not applied researcher. So I was wondering if you could just speak to that population in ways that this course might really be beneficial for folks who are in uh, disciplines or fields or jobs that may not be primarily oriented toward applied practice? That's a great question. And, and I have had many such people in um, courses in the past. Um, where I would go with that is to encourage them to really reflect on who they are in relation to this research. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that they're bringing and why are they doing it? And so um, in, the, in, in some historic conventional qualitative methods, uh, we would all be told with, to come in with a blank slate. So those of us who had a discipline would be at a disadvantage. Um, or we would have been told to start, start with an explicit theoretical framework and then take that in and try and build on it. I'd say no. Um, if, you, if you don't identify as having an applied disciplinary perspective, who are you in the world? What's, what's the particular thing you're bringing? And it may, for example, be a, a collection of theoretical commitments. I, I take a critical social theory lens to the world and I really want to work on equity issues. That's who I am and that's what I want to bring. And to turn, try and encourage them to articulate that as the intellectual scaffolding they, they are bringing into the study that would work as a theoretical framework in past methods might have or as a, a disciplinary perspective would be, but to really reflect on what that means. Um, you know, what are what are my commitments? What are what are the mandates with knowledge? Who do I intersect with? Now, you won't necessarily get to write a whole essay about that when you are uh, publishing a piece of research, but it gives you a way of thinking about how you engage with those positionings. Beautiful, beautiful. Apologies for the call. I do not disturb on, but I guess think people uh, know they see that thing at the bottom where it's like blow through someone's do not disturb. <laughs> anyway, apologies for, to everybody for that. Paul, um, I want. I have a question that I think will be fun for Sally for us to close, but um, I know you're always actively thinking as we're listening to these conversations. And I want to give you an opportunity to let us know what's on your mind and what you're thinking and you know, see if there's anything else you want to talk to Sally about. Well, Sally, you know, I, I, I've, of course, had the fortune of being in your in your class, and I know that you like to um, use in-class exercises and other ways of engaging participants. I wonder if you can just say a word about, about the, how, you, how you do um, experiential learning. Yeah, 
know, I, I, um, I found in the courses that that it is not always helpful in this material to break up too much of the conversation into, you know, spend half of a day all together in some breakout group. I think people do benefit from the whole, but with, with moving back and forth into small table conversations about certain things, for example, um, into getting to know a smaller group, cohort of people um, in their relationship to their own research and, and poking at one another with regard to surfacing those kinds of questions. So it, it uh, pedagogically doesn't look like any anything in a textbook set of how one would engage experiential learning. Um, and for the most part in the courses, uh, learners have expressed a comfort in all being together and all engaging and, you know, stopping when there's a need to, to stop and reflect on a certain thing that needs more clarification. Um, I do, we all, we all recognize that in a course there will be somebody who's insistent that the focus be on their particular, their particular study and their particular um, issue. And I've been a teacher for a lot of years, so I, I do think that I have a reasonable instinct to try and ensure that every voice that needs to be heard gets heard and to try and um, uh, take my, res the responsibility, I think a teacher should, to ensure that the conversation stays um, addressing the needs of the majority. And we do have, for those people who have an insistent need, then that might happen in a, a coffee coffee uh, session conversation or out in the hall afterwards or even an email correspondence following. So that really the, the, the group as a whole has the feeling that it's all involved in all parts. Yeah. That, said, it, that said, when people raise raise issues from their own studies, that can be a wonderful jumping off point for things that cause people to think about their own. So it's, it's not at all that we prohibit people talking about their things, but I just try and ensure that certain interests don't dominate the whole. It's beautiful. And, you know, those conversations, if people are insistent, they can happen in a formal consultation as well. So, <laughs> it's cool. so you know, um, one of the things that Jeff and I and Paul routinely do in preparation for these conversations is go back to people's personal bios that they submit that are online at Research Talks website and the course descriptions. And there's this really intriguing piece. It's It feels like reading a good story when you read your bio and your description. And in particular, there's a part in the um, description where you talk about how you allow participants an opportunity to wrestle with the intellectual mechanics that qualitative data analysis entails. And then in your bio, you talk about your program of scholarship and how it's grounded in the fields of philosophy of science, including um, the epistemological basis of disciplinary knowledge, development in health fields, and the nature of ev ev evidence claims in a complex health policy environment. So that kind of idea of here's Dr. Sally Thorne, you know, you know, epistemologic based disciplinary knowledge, philosophy of science, you know, nature of evidentiary claims, and then this idea that what we do as qualitative researchers is necessarily wrestle with these intellectual mechanics. Mm -hmm. And the course, you doing this course makes so much sense to me. And I just was wondering in closing kind of, uh, if you could talk a bit about how that's not a coincidence at all. Yeah, no, no, that's not. I think really that's what's that's what excites me about the course. If it if, if somebody had told me as a you know young graduate student you'd spend your spend your life being fascinated by qualitative method, I would have thought, oh no, stop <laughs> me now. But but yeah. it, it it is because it is so much part of that that larger philosophical question of how we know what we know and what why do we do what we do and what can we do and what's possible in this world. And so all of these issues come together in in the enactment of qualitative research. Um, right now I'm working on medical systems and dying, which is a thing in Canada, and it is socially and legislatively and ethically and in every way uh, complex. So a perfect topic to be able to enact that kind of lens. And um, yeah, no, it's it's very much me and I can't imagine uh, stopping, but I, I do love to share that with people because I think there's so many smart, engaged, committed people out there who see some possibility in qualitative research. And if they can only take it and make it their own, 
and and make those projects their own they then they too can really see qualitative approaches as a really powerful way to start to solve problems and i i mentioned the medical assistance and dying because frankly it's probably the first time in my career that governments and health authorities and others are looking to us researchers, qualitative researchers, to help guide policy in a way that they never have before. And they understand the complexity, they own it, they're responsible for it. And, and so to see that in action, to see it, it engaging and informing all of those processes all in a just-in-time way has been incredibly exciting. It's beautiful. It truly is a topic that really it, it's designed for the kinds of things our minds and projects achieve. It's fabulous. Well, this has been great um, on behalf of Paul and Jeff um, and everyone who's going to be interested in attending the courses. We want to thank you for your time and sharing your brilliance. And uh, we um, will look forward to July, which will be here too quickly, right? <laughs> it's been a real pleasure. Uh, we're going to close the conversation and uh, it'll continue at the intensive. Thanks, Sarah.